intermolecular forces, the forces between molecules, can substantially affect physical properties. These forces can ultimately be understood with Coulomb's law, where electrically charged particles of opposite sign attract one another. The larger the charges, the stronger the electrostatic interaction. And this law applies not only to fully charged particles, as found in ionic compounds, but also to smaller partial charges, as found in polar molecules. It's these forces of attraction that result in condensed phases. All else being equal, intermolecular forces decrease from solids to liquids to gases. While a solid packs tightly in a rigid framework due to strong forces between particles, a liquid, displaying slightly weaker forces, allow particles to move relative to one another. In a gaseous substance, particles interact negligibly, if at all. One problem here is that this analysis assumes nonpolar molecules would always be gases. And while this is sometimes true, as in nitrogen gas, N2, or methane gas, CH4, there are actually many cases where nonpolar molecules are liquids or even solids. For example, consider a molecule of diatomic bromine. Since each atom here is the same, and there is no difference in electronegativity within the covalent bromine-bromine bond, there is no net dipole moment present. And without a dipole moment, there can be no dipole-dipole forces. However, while the time average of electron distribution within the bromine molecule is uniform, there actually exists very small but non-zero fluctuations in electron density that occur at any given moment. Think of the electron orbitals not as rigid spheres, but as diffuse clouds of electrons that can temporarily drift around relative to the nuclei. Polarizability is the property that supports this dynamic distortion of electron density. Now if a collection of bromine molecules is considered, we see transient fluctuations in one molecule can induce temporary dipole moments in adjacent molecules. This effect, due to the correlated movement of electrons, gives rise to weak attractive forces, so-called London dispersion forces. And because the total partial charges generated in these fleeting interactions are small, the London forces are typically the weakest intermolecular force. And since polarizability scales with the volume occupied by electrons, the strength of London forces increases with the total number of electrons in the substance. This accounts for why bromine is a liquid under standard conditions, while chlorine is a gas and iodine is a solid. All else being equal, the London forces would also increase with higher molecular surface area, which provides additional points of contact for inducing temporary partial charges. This type of force also explains how many polymers like polyethylene or polystyrene can exist as solids even when they are nonpolar and only consist of carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds. Looking at the other extreme of intermolecular forces, we find the strongest interaction between covalent molecules when dealing with highly polarized covalent bonds. Consider a bond between hydrogen and one of the three most electronegative elements in the periodic table, either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Because of these elements' high electronegativity, electrons are not shared evenly in this bond with hydrogen. Instead, electron density builds up and creates a substantial partial negative charge about the more electronegative atom, with a resulting partial positive charge generated about hydrogen. This high degree of charge separation creates a significant bond-dipole moment that can strongly interact with another electronegative element on a different molecule. When in this arrangement, this dipole-dipole interaction is so strong, it's given a special name called hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding can have a profound impact in many systems, from the physical properties of water to the complementary base pairing of nucleic acids in DNA and the structural stability of polymers ranging from cotton and collagen to nylon and Kevlar. Let's consider Kevlar to illustrate the power of hydrogen bonding in polymers. 
Kevlar is a material used in everything from bicycle tires, ropes and clothing, to automotive brakes and personal armor. On an equal weight basis, its tensile strength is five times that of steel. Structurally, it's an aromatic polyamide consisting of relatively rigid polymeric strands. The high tensile strength can be understood by looking at how these separate strands interact with one another. With many carbonyl groups and NH centers, intermolecular hydrogen bonds can form between adjacent strands. We can understand this binding of polymeric strands three-dimensionally with the use of electrostatic potential energy maps. These maps allow us to visualize the charge distribution of a molecule, essentially allowing us to track variable electron density on a molecular surface, where red indicates a relative abundance of electrons and blue indicates a relative absence of electrons. Knowledge of the charge distribution can then be used to determine how molecules interact with one another. In this case, we see Kevlar strands arrange and come together in a complementary way, with partial positive regions in blue binding to partial negative regions in red. This makes it difficult for one polymer to slide relative to another. They're essentially tied together through electrostatic attractions. Understanding structure property relationships requires a classification of substances and their corresponding interactions. If ionic compounds are considered, the charges involved are so large that interionic forces dominate as the primary interaction between particles with relatively high binding energies. Covalent compounds, on the other hand, must first be classified by polarity. If NH, OH, or FH bonds are present, the potential for hydrogen bonding exists. If other polarized bonds are present that impart a net dipole moment to the molecule, then dipole-dipole forces are also possible, although they are typically weaker than hydrogen bonding. In all cases, whether polar or nonpolar, London dispersion forces will be present to a varying degree depending on the size and shape of the molecules. Although these interactions are typically quite small, for large molecules with many electrons and points of contact, the London forces can be relatively high. This diagram emphasizes an important continuum of interactions from the very weak to the very strong. For perspective, intramolecular bonds, the bonds within molecules, are typically an order of magnitude larger or more in strength relative to these intermolecular forces we've discussed. Ultimately, it is the collection of all interactions within molecules and between molecules that determines the physical and chemical properties of a substance.